Okay, so I will be reading today from a um, my forthcoming novel, uh, which is called The Wife Who Wasn't, and which will be published in April 2021 by New Europe Books. And before I go ahead and read the excerpt, uh, I need to tell you a few words about the novel. So um, half of the novel takes place in Chisinau, which is the capital of the Republic of Moldova, and half takes place in Santa Barbara, California. And it starts sometime in the mid nineties and it goes all the way to 2008 when uh, the so-called tea fire happened in Santa Barbara. Um, this is a novel in which I basically wanted to create a clash between two worlds, um, former communist Eastern Europe and um, America. And for this, I chose the Republic of Moldova, although I was born in Romania, but um, Moldova used to be part of the so-called Greater Romania until the Soviet takeover, which happened during World War II. And since then, until I think 1992, Moldova was part of the Soviet um, empire, and then it gained its independence, and then it started to transition toward post-communism. It was and still is the poorest uh, European country. Uh, a lot of its population works abroad, um, looks, works in Europe for uh, mostly as um, caretakers for uh, the elder European population. So I chose this uh, society because it had the most remnants from the communist world. And I wanted characters to be representative, to be emblems for the communist world. And that's why I, end I ended up not choosing uh, Romanian characters but rather I chose Russian Moldovans because I thought that for an American reader, Romanian characters could be, I don't know, could have different connotations and a Russian character would be more emblematic for the, so for the Soviet world. So I want my Russian friends to understand that these characters are not necessarily specific in their Russianness, but that they are specific as post-communist or rather post-Soviet types. They are really human types and that's why they are slightly cartoonish and that's deliberate because I, I didn't want them to be as much individuals as I wanted them to be types, human types. Okay, so in the part that I'm going to read, the characters are Sammy, who is um, a Californian Jewish man. Who, he's a retired jeweler, he's in late 40s. And then there is Tanya, who is um, a Russian Moldovan woman, who um, is a former hairdresser. She's in her mid thirties. She's very confident as many Eastern European women are. And she emigrates from uh, Moldova to Santa Barbara in 1996. And then there is Anna, who is Sammy's teenage daughter. Okay, so. It was their first trip as a family. Sammy, Tanya, and Anna, all in his black Subaru, fighting the snail-paced traffic between Santa Barbara and LA. Sammy was annoyed, Anna was melancholy, only Tanya was in good spirits, cheerful as a carefree toddler on a ride. While Sammy kept grumbling, complaining about the other drivers and their cars, Tanya took everything in with the ferocious thirst of a drunk or as if they were at a picnic in the middle of a lush landscape and couldn't have enough of it. Oh, look at that red car. What was that, a Corvette? That sounds nice, French. And look at that silver BMW. That's a serious, dependable car. Did you see that young man who just went by? Wasn't he speeding? What a nerve, go after him. I see there's no speech, but he should be taught a lesson. God, look at all these lanes. Two, four, eight lanes, no, 10. 10 lanes, can you believe it? They won't believe me when I tell them back home. It's because of all those lanes and cars that we have so much pollution, Anna noted dryly, wishing to put a dent in Tanya's enthusiasm. Bullshit, what pollution? In Moldova, you can't even see the sky. Here, look at the sky, it's so blue. In Moldova, we have no cars and yet more pollution. Do you, know, do you want to know why? No. Not only Anna didn't want to know, but each time Tanya uttered the word Moldova, Moldova this, Moldova that, she felt like shoving a pillow down her throat to make her shut up. She didn't care a bit about Moldova, even though it was the place where her grandparents came from. Before Tanya had come to live with them, Moldova had been a faraway place endowed with a vague mythology of remote origins. 
And when asked about her family's background, Anna would name it, happy that, like all the other kids around, she could claim that her family too came from somewhere else. But ever since that name had come to be associated with that woman, a certain unease, even shame, began to hover around it. The woman whose armpits emanated an odor like a cross between a skunk and overripe French cheese. Anna wondered whether the woman was using deodorant now, given the lack of smell in the car. The first stop was at the jewelry shop Sammy's parents had owned on Hill Street, Goldstein's Gold, which was now an antique store. From the outside, it was as innocuous as all the other boutiques on that street, a door with a bell and a window with a clutter of old moth-eaten fabrics peacock feathers, yellowed gloves, and Chinese board games. The inside, however, had stayed the same as in the old days, Sammy told them. Even the cash register with its gilded surface and antediluvian keys appeared to be the same. Like all antique shops, the place was dark, a welcoming darkness, and exuded a slight staleness like that of an incubator with hidden nooks and crannies where a jack-in-the-box could pop up or a melody box could start playing an old tune. Numerous dolls in lace dresses could be seen all over and doll sized kitchen utensils and wares peppered the spaces in between them. The darker nooks were lit by the discreet light of some vaporous lamp with the slender pedestal and pastel, pastel colored shade and whose chiaroscuro sang an enchanted spellbound song. song. A singer, a singer. Tanya pointed at a sewing machine. My mother had one when I, was, when I was a child. Many of my clothes were made with it. Her excitement drew a smile from the stone owner, owner, but no reaction from her companions. A few seconds later, an old iron. My mother used one just like this when I was a child. Now she was pointing at a heavy rusty iron that seemed to, be, to weigh 20 pounds. Why do Americans buy all these old things when they have so many other new and better things in their stores? For a few seconds, no one bothered to answer. Eventually, the store owner ventured, well, I don't think they buy them to use them. Rather, they buy them for their old value, you know, just to look at them. Look at them. What's the point of looking at some useless sewing machine or an old rusty iron. Now the owner looked her up and down as if she were a slow-witted child. He explained in a calm, thoughtful voice. They have charm and value because they are old and useless. They are part of a bygone world. Though things were still blurry in her mind, little by little, Tanya was beginning to grasp a strip of clarity. Americans, who lived in a world of new things, occasionally took trips to islands of the past where antiquated things were stored. And they paid good money for them because they were part of a world they had killed and now wanted to artificially resurrect. So I'm gonna stop this chapter here and I'm gonna to go to the next chapter, which is a letter from Tanya to her mother uh, who lives in Kishino, Moldova, and she recounts the trip to LA in this letter. Dear mother, I finally saw it. Los Angeles, the city of angels. To tell the truth, the most impressive part was the road there with its 10 lanes and thousands of expensive glossy cars. The reason for our trip was that Sammy was invited to the 30th anniversary of his high school graduation in Beverly Hills. So we were all dressed in our Sunday best. Sammy had even given me a necklace from his mother's jewelry collection, a heavy gold chain with a little heart studded with diamonds. That woman had good taste, let me tell you. Anna refuses to wear jewelry. That is, she doesn't wear gold, silver, or diamonds. All she cares for are those silly, colorful things made by Native Americans. That's how they call them here, you know, Indians. That should tell you how unfair this world is. Our Irina would know how to take advantage of the treasure this family has. But maybe it's not the girl's fault, Anna, I mean. 
After all, she's a child who grew up without a mother. What does she know? To tell the truth, I expected something fancier given that these people, Sammy and his classmates, come from good, rich families. But I should have known. The restaurant was fancy all right, but the food, at the beginning they served us chips. I thought it was a joke, chips. Then it got a little better. Some waiters with platters offered us finger food, lox, cheese, ham. It was okay, but still nothing to write home about. Drinks, those we had plenty of, wine, beer, mineral water, but no real food. Yet Sammy had paid $150 for each of us. I thought it was a robbery. I wanted to complain to someone, but didn't know to whom. So each time Sammy introduced me to one of his former classmates, I complained to them. They all looked at me with that stupid grin on their faces as if I was speaking in a foreign language. Then they asked where my lovely accent was from. They all seemed to be in love with my accent. Imagine when I said I was from Moldova, they said, oh, as if that reminded them of a whole world that was familiar to them. Only one of them said my grandmother was from there too, but never spoke about it. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe she was from Romania. I'm not really sure. And a few others exclaimed, how interesting. I never thought that being born in Moldova had anything interesting about it, but I felt proud that this is what they thought. Most of all, I was pleased that all those men with full bellies and fat wallets were so taken with me. Some of them let their gaze wander over my curvy body, and I didn't blame them. I mean, surrounded by all those women straight as a stick and not a bit of flesh on them, those poor men must be starving. Let them look, I thought. Although, on the other hand, those women were well preserved. They must have been Sammy's age since they were classmates, but they barely looked my age. Their skin was smooth with no wrinkles. Still, there was something strange about their noses and mouths. I can't quite put my finger on it. They all had the same kind of mouth as if someone had taken an extra piece of flesh and glued it to their face. And, they, and their noses, they all had that tiny Michael Jack Jackson doll-like nose. I realized that only now, for at the time I wasn't sure what it reminded me of. I spoke with a few of them and the impression of strangeness increased. These women, they were not talking with me. They were talking through me. I don't know how to explain it because on the surface, they were very nice. They looked me straight in the eye. It seemed to savor every word I uttered. Oh, Moldova, that's so interesting. Everything I said was interesting. Although to think of it, all I said was, I'm Sammy's wife and I'm from Moldova over and over again. It was actually quite dull. Um, and when they said, oh, how interesting, I started to explain that, no, it wasn't that interesting. It was actually quite dull, dull and gray. This is how life was there. And I kept explaining and the women's eyes never left mine as if their entire world depended on my words. And at the end, they said again, how interesting. Although one of them said with tears in her eyes, you are so brave, so brave. I would never have the courage to go to another country. And you speak English so well. So in the end, I began to think that I was an interesting woman who spoke English very well. Let me tell you, no one can boost your morale like an American, your daughter, Tanya. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you.